Yeah, when I first saw these machines in their rotting boxes in the stone collection, I was a little concerned. Yeah, it's beyond crusty. So today, we'll see about restoring one of these absolutely mold-infested keyboards. Will it work? When I did the video on how I restore a Commodore 64, I promised a follow-up on how to clean a Commodore 64 keyboard. Unfortunately, the footage I shot of that oh-so-nasty keyboard was unusable. But I was pretty sure that there was another machine in the Stone Collection at least as bad as that one, but I was having trouble finding it. Finally this spring, I decided it's time to start organizing the Stone Collection because I'm spending way too much time digging for stuff. So in the process of reorganizing and getting things into bin, I finally found the machine I was thinking of. And here it is. It is a tasty beast. I think it might even be worse than that other machine was. What do you think? This video is gonna cover the most common Commodore 64 keyboard made by Mitsumi. There is an earlier keyboard that was from the late Vic 20s that was in early Commodore 64s that uses rubber domes instead of springs. I have yet to come across one of these in the wild, but I suspect there's some that use this keyboard in the Stone Collection because these parts came from Carl's parts bin. To start with, we're going to need a few tools and supplies, most of which you probably already have. Everything mentioned here will be linked to in the description. What you're going to need is a number two Phillips screwdriver for opening the Commodore 64's case, a very small Phillips screwdriver for the many teeny screws in the keyboard. A pair of tweezers will help a lot with the small parts. You will need a basic soldering iron, but just to disconnect and reconnect two wires, so it's not too tough. You'll also need a key puller, and you'll want this inexpensive wire type because the common pullers like this one won't work. I also recommend that you have a few brushes on hand for cleaning. I like to use a basic toothbrush, an anti-static brush, and a common automotive detailing brush. For cleaning things, you're going to need to have a few rags on hand, like these common microfiber towels that I use. Pretty much anything will do. Torn up old t-shirt. Finally, you're going to want to have three to four containers with lids. I'm just gonna use three Tupperware containers. I do recommend having a small container for the screws so you don't drop the screws on the carpet in the living room while you're trying to restore a keyboard while also watching TV with the wife and playing with the poppers. Not that that's ever happened to me. You're also gonna need a few basic supplies. I recommend having some 90% or better isopropyl alcohol, Dawn dishwashing liquid. I also always have on hand some glass cleaner for just basic cleaning. Also going to need something to prop the keyboard frame up on while you're doing reassembly. I just like to use a small box which I cut down to fit the keyboard. I'll show you that a little later. And finally, you're really going to have to stretch the budget because you're going to need one sheet of clean printer paper. This Commodore 64 has definitely seen better days. Today we're just going to be doing the keyboard. But in the future, I plan to do a video on how you can restore a Commodore 64 just using basic tools and supplies. If this machine has problems with it, which in its condition, I can't imagine that it doesn't, I plan to use this one for that video. Also, before I start, normally I would say, take a picture of it so you know where the keys go and you put it back together. But frankly, you could refer back to this video. You can look up a picture on your phone on the internet. It's not hard to find a picture of a Commodore 64 keyboard. So whether or not you do, it's up to you. So normally I'd also recommend that you test the machine to see where you're at before you start taking it apart. But given the extreme nastiness in this machine, I wanna get it cleaned out before I add electrons. Now, because this keyboard is particularly nasty, I'm going to take the optional step of taking it outside, brushing out as much of the mold as I can with a detailing brush, and then I'm going to blow it out to get as much crud out before I start pulling it apart in my shop. Getting the machine out of the keyboard is a piece of cake. Getting the keyboard out of the machine is a piece of cake. Getting the machine out of the keyboard is a pain in the butt. 
You just remove these three screws to open the case. Then you unplug the keyboard connector and LED and the case halves will separate. Then just remove the eight screws holding the keyboard into the top case and it'll lift right out. If you're working on a Commodore 64C, then you'll need to remove and later replace two additional screws inside connecting the keyboard to a pair of brackets. So next, before we start pulling things apart, we need to get our containers ready. I filled the larger one with warm water and Dawn detergent. I also have two more ready to put in the springs and stems. Finally, I used this small container for the screws. We'll start by removing all the keys and springs from the keyboard. The keys go into warm soapy water to soak while the springs go into one of the dry containers. You want to save the space bar for last. It has a stabilizing rod on it that it's easier to remove with the other keys around it out of the way. To remove a key, simply push the key puller wires over either side of the key, then rotate it 45 degrees to engage the corners. Pull up firmly to remove. I like to press my thumb against the frame and use that to apply controlled pressure so the spring doesn't go flying when the key cap comes off. Sometimes these can be really tight, but be careful not to rock back and forth too much, or you may break a stem off in the key. If that happens, I'll show you how I get that piece out of the key at the end in troubleshooting. Once the key comes loose, the spring comes with it, and you can put them each in their appropriate container. Once the rest of the keys are off, you can remove the space bar by gently pulling up from the stem and then disengage the stabilizer bar on one end with tweezers. The space bar can then be removed by sliding it off the other end of the stabilizer. You remove the stabilizer by gently unsnapping it from these clips. I like to push the center tab on the clip with my nail as I pull the bar off. The space bar goes into the water with the rest of the keys to be washed while the stabilizer bar goes into the bin that I'm going to put the stems into. One thing to be aware of is that the spacebar spring is slightly larger than the others, so I put it into the bin that I'm using for the stems to keep it separate. There we go. All the keys are in warm water to soak while we disassemble the rest of the keyboard. Now's a good time to desolder the two wires for the shift lock key. Just heat the solder with an iron set to about 350 degrees Celsius, then gently pull the wire out with tweezers or needle nose pliers. Don't apply heat for too long or it can melt plastic parts in the switch. Once the two wires are loose, we're done with the soldering iron until we reconnect them at the end. Next, we need to remove the 23 little screws from the circuit board and put them into something so you don't lose any more of them than you already did on that rug in the living room. A couple screws are under the strain relief tape over the wiring harness connection, but I found it's easy to just unscrew them right through the tape rather than removing it. Once all the screws are out, you can lift the circuit board away from the black frame, but be careful not to spill all the now free plungers. You can remove the plungers one at a time with tweezers, but it's a lot easier just to tip them out. Just be careful not to lose any. Put the plungers into their container for later cleaning, and all you have left to do is to gently push the shift lock key out the front of the frame. That's all there is to the disassembly. Now that all these parts are free and organized, we can get on to the next step to remove all that nastiness from them. I like to start by cleaning the black plastic frame in a sink with soapy water and a brush. Once it's nice and clean and rinsed, hopefully without spreading water all over the place, uh, failed there for me. But then I like to gently tap it with the key openings facing down because they tend to hold a lot of water and just knock it out and then lay it side to dry. The next thing I like to clean because they take a while to fully dry are the individual key caps. And this is where the bad news comes in. I have not found a better way to clean the keys other than to clean each one individually on all four sides and the top with a damp cloth and warm soapy water. And then put them in a container of clean water just to rinse off. Well, since I got 66 keys I still need to clean, let's get to it.
Next, I like to clean the plungers just by rubbing them gently with a microfiber cloth. Maybe dampened with a little water, but generally it's not necessary. Uh, in this case, these were so nasty. I actually had to blow them off and then clean each one individually with some alcohol. If you do look at the business end of a plunger, it has this tiny little pad on the end. This is an electrically conductive rubber that actually completes the circuit when you press the key. If the rubbers become oxidized, it becomes too high of a resistance and then you don't get a good contact and the key doesn't work well or you got to kind of mash on it to get it to go. What we need to do is carefully abrade each of these pads with a mild abrasive, which I like to call 10,000 grit sandpaper, but yeah, it's just a sheet of copy paper. Now it's important not to use unusually rough or slick paper for this. Just use standard 20 pound copy paper. Just a letter or A4 sheet should be just fine. Take each plunger and very gently slide the pad along the paper. You should see two light gray stripes along the paper as the top layer is removed. Do this once or twice for each plunger and then set them aside for reassembly. Once a plunger is cleaned, I recommend you do not touch the pads. If you know you were having trouble with the keyboard before disassembly, you might want to go ahead and check the pads for conductivity. You can just do this with a multimeter. They need to be under a thousand ohms and typically I find them in the one to 250 ohm range. I've not actually had a bad pad yet on a Commodore 64, but I've seen plenty on other machines. So you know it's gonna happen. If after I clean a pad, I find one that's too high a resistance, I would just replace it because I got plenty of spares. But if you can't do that, I would try cleaning it again. If cleaning it again still leaves you with too high a resistance, you're going to need to get a replacement plunger. There are some real sketchy things out there like conductive paint that you could try. But, you know, unless you have to just find yourself a plunger on eBay, make sure you get the right kind. There's two or three different ones. From what I've seen, there are three basic types of stems. Now the white one on the left, that's just the stem for the bubble keyboard, so you don't see those very often. Now the two in the middle look very similar. The black one on the left has a three millimeter top on it, while the black one on the right has a five millimeter top. So it's just the size of the piece that actually snaps into the key varies. So just make sure you get the right three or five millimeter stem. Now I have tried a 3D printed stem as well. They work okay, but the keys are a little wobbly on them. That's the blue one. But be aware that you still need to have one of the little pads off of a regular stem in order to use a 3D printed one. So I usually go with the less is more theory with the springs. I like to put them in this little ball that came with the ultrasonic cleaner. Uh, just to contain them and then I blow them off. This knocks all the dust and stuff loose without spreading it all over my shop. If I have some springs that are rusty, like the keyboard spring and a few others, I just put them in a little bit of Evaporust or maybe Furtan, some kind of a rust converter. As you can see, these springs look great after a night soaking in Evaporust. Finally, the circuit board just gets a good wipe down with alcohol. Now this one is a carbon pad type. I no reason why, but I don't like these as well as I do the one with just a nice circuit board. The circuit board ones are easier to clean. I don't feel like I could damage them, but either way, just wipe it down with alcohol and you should be good. If the strain relief tape is really ugly and this one looks fine, I have removed it before in the past, clean up all of the tape residue that's left behind and then just put a new sheet of packing tape over it. I think it just held the wires in place for soldering in the factory. All right, now that everything is as clean and shiny as we can get it, we can put it all back together. Reassembly is mainly just the reverse of disassembly, but there's a few tricks that can make it easier. And so we'll go through the process here. As I mentioned earlier, you can support the frame any way you want. I like to use a box like this small box that tomatoes come from Costco in. Just cut it down to make a tray that holds it. I tape up the tray with some gaffer tape just to make it more sturdy and more attractive. It holds this perfectly for reassembly. However you do it, just make sure that you've got it set up so that the stems can hang out the bottom as you install them. And that's the next step. The stem in each of its spots with the tabs aligned so they can be fully inserted. And once all the stems are in, you can reinstall the circuit board and reinstall all those 23 tiny little screws. 
Honestly, the more I do this, the less cumbersome it seems to be. It's not that big a deal. But, you know, I'm a human. We like to complain. Next, you just push the shift lock key back in from the front. You want the two terminals with the wire solder on towards the part of the keyboard where most of the keys are. Then just heat the solder on a terminal and insert the corresponding wire through the hole under the melted solder with tweezers. Try not to heat the solder for more than about five seconds and once the wire is through, touch the iron to the wire along with the solder for one to two seconds just to make sure you get a good solder joint. <laughs> so now to add back all those keys starting with the space bar. Now I've laid these out for clarity just for the video purposes. You certainly don't need to do that if you don't want to. So looking at the space bar, you'll see that one side has a slightly gentler angle, and this is the side that goes forward. I like to reconnect the stabilizer bar to the clips on the frame and then set the spring in place. Next, I slide the slot in the insert attached to the space bar over one stabilizer bar end, then using tweezers, I insert the other end. The space bar may come loose from the clips while you're doing this, but you can easily just snap it back into place. The spacebar can then be rotated so the guides on the inserts fit into the holes in the frame and this needs to go over the large spacebar spring as you fit it. The spacebar should then snap onto its plunger and you'll be able to press it on either end and it'll work just great. The rest of the keys each get a spring and then just snap onto their plunger. The wider keys like the return, shift, function, and control keys each have more than one place to snap the plunger into. For most of these keys, the best way to see which way to go is simply install all the keys around them first. In the case of the function keys, which don't have keys around them, they go to the right mounting point so the keys overhangs to the left towards the main keys on the keyboard. And there we have it, a fully restored keyboard. In this case, I'm using the Ziff 64 for testing since the machine this goes into still needs a restoration. Since my capture system isn't currently working, I'm gonna have to do this by setting my phone on a tripod and pointing it at a screen. So let's see how this keyboard works. Everything is working perfectly. On a few keys like the function key where it doesn't actually put anything on the screen, you'll see the cursor flicker a little bit when you press them so you can still tell that they work. Also to test the Commodore key, press Shift Commodore to change character sets. Honestly, I have had very few issues with Commodore keyboards. Probably the biggest issue I've had is having to replace missing or broken keys. So I haven't had a lot of opportunity to do troubleshooting, but here's a few tips to get you started if you do run into trouble. Now, if the keyboard doesn't work at all, the first thing I check is to make sure that it's plugged in correctly and in the correct direction. The other thing I would suspect is 6526 in the Commodore 64 itself. It's at U1. This is the chip that handles IO with the keyboard. So if that chip's not working right, the keyboard's not gonna work right. Uh, one tip you can have is if they're socketed, there are two 6526s, so you can just try swapping them. And if swapping it over makes your keyboard work, you know you need to replace the other IC. Often there are broken keys on these old machines. If I have a key with a part of the stem broken off in it, then I use a small drill to bore a hole in the stem stub. Then I use a screw with a very sharp point to grab the stub and pull it out. You need to try not to engage the screw too tightly or it may swell the stem and jam it tighter into the key. If you just have one or two keys that aren't working, I would check the stems and the uh, pads the stems contact on the keyboard. Normally, if there's a problem with the circuit, you're gonna either have no keyboard at all or you're gonna have batches of keys that don't work. So if it's just one key, look at just that area and try to see what the problem is. If you have a group of keys that don't work, then you need to take a look at the circuit. Take a look at the wiring, the connector, make sure that everything's connected up. If one wire is detached, you'll have a group, I think it's eight or nine keys that won't work. The keyboard is a matrix with several keys attached to each circuit. When one of these connections is bad, then all the keys in that set is affected. Now, I know this video is not gonna be a big view hit because you know it's not so sexy cleaning a keyboard, but I felt it was really important to have one good example out there for people that are doing this on your own machines. So if you're trying to restore your own Commodore 64 or even a VIC-20 keyboard and you're having problems, feel free to comment below and we'll see if we can help you out. 
Now I've restored a whole bunch of Commodore 64s, so if you want to see more of that, check out the playlist right here. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for coming. A day without coffee, it's like sleep.